The technological singularity. It's the moment tech starts advancing faster than our ability to comprehend it, or what your parents call 2010. But think of it like the point in the future when your sex bot finally tells you you're too stupid to screw. It's like jacking off a paramecium or teabagging a mud puddle. It's gross and demeaning. So pack your bags because this is Nia the Curve. Welcome to Knee the Curve, the future news. Don't get left in the past, hit subscribe to stay up to date on the technological singularity. The idea of which is the topic of today's show. The singularity is truly the point of most extreme change, a point of no return. That's why it was named after the event horizon of a black hole. You wrote a book called The Singularity. It was, you the know, singularity is back in near. Two <laughs> this is what like cult leaders, this <laughs> The end well, is near. Well, this, it, this it back, is, back in 2006, you write is, this book. It is a play on the end is near. That's Neil deGrasse Tyson just being a dick to Google's director of engineering for their initiative to create a superintelligence, Ray Kurzweil, whose book helped popularize the word singularity. First, I'm angry with you for taking our word. Whoa, whoa. We're still talking about the word singularity, right? Oh shit, are we about to cancel Kurzweil? For taking our word singularity. <sighs> Carry on. That word had a perfectly good use, perfectly fine definition. It's what happens at the beginning of the universe and in the center of a black hole. That's right, Kurzweil. Singularity is not the word of your people. And you are forbidden from using it, especially not when there's physicists around. It's 2019. Think. Anyway. The idea of the singularity has been mainstream for a long time. Blade Runner, The Terminator, 2001, The Matrix, Ex Machina, Ghost in the Shell all play on this idea of an artificial superintelligence going rogue and killing everyone. Because making a movie where an AI goes rogue and cures aging, solves global warming, ends traffic, stabilizes the economy, invents warp drive, and just makes a girl feel understood, doesn't put butts in theaters. But that's exactly what the upside of a singularity would mean. A super intelligent AI solving all humanity's greatest challenges like the ultimate bulldozer parent. It'll just remove all our obstacles, making way for a generation of kids even Gen Zers can call fragile. Machine intelligence is the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. The machines will then be better at inventing than we are. What this means is basically a telescoping of the future. So think of all the crazy technologies that you could have imagined maybe humans could have developed in the fullness of time. So cures for aging, space colonization, self-replicating nanobots or uploading of minds into computers, all kinds of science fiction stuff that's nevertheless consistent with the laws of physics. All of this, a superintelligence could develop, and possibly quite rapidly. And while most people's idea of the future probably resembles Star Trek, it's not the most realistic future. People still age. Nobody has augmented intelligence. There's no money. People are still bald. Really? Balding is still a thing? We can fix balding 10 years ago. So this vision of the future is obviously way out of touch. In his book, Kurzweil theorizes that after humans merge with technology, we'll have no need for physical bodies and we'll turn all matter into computational processing. Our glowing orb of unified consciousness will expand into the universe in all directions at the speed of light, absorbing all matter into its ever-growing sphere of intelligence. Cool. And that's his ideal scenario. Both these visions of the future have some scary parts. On the one hand, having your consciousness downloaded into virtual reality. On the other, balding and eventually dying of old age. So hopefully we can figure out some not so scary middle ground where we get to keep our real hair in a real world where the computers don't swallow us up. And in order to do that, we have to be very careful about how smart we let computers get. But historically, the advancement of information technology has not been something we've been able to control. To understand why, here's Ray. The price performance of computing has been a very smooth, doubly exponential curve through thick and thin, through World Wars, the Cold War, the Great Depression, and a few other things happened. And despite all of that, you've got this very smooth, very predictable trajectory. He's talking specifically about Moore's Law, which states that the number of transistors they can fit on a chip has been doubling roughly every two years. It's called Moore's Law because this dude named Gordon Moore happened to notice it. So he gets a law. 
Great job, Gordon. You really noticed the shit out of that. I'm just saying, that was an easy law to get. Newton invented calculus to describe the law of gravity. Gordon Moore just went 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Hey, cool. Gordon Moore founded Intel, so he must be super smart. I just definitely could have got that law. I could have got it, but you know, it's cool. Right place, right time. You're a billionaire, so you get a law. I'll get a law. I'll get a law one day. So yeah, computer speed has been multiplying as predictably as Sting's wife's orgasms. And you might be thinking, hey, wait a second. Earlier you said we weren't able to control the advancement of information technology, but computer chips are man-made. Well, information technology is more than just computer chips. Brains are information tech. Bacteria are infotech. DNA is infotech. In fact, the exponential growth of intelligence in the universe may actually be a physical law of nature. See, it took around 10 billion years for the universe to come up with Earth and single-celled life, but then it only took like 4 billion years to become multicellular life, and then only around a billion years to become monkeys, and then only like a million years to come up with this. <laughs> In case you were wondering, that is a picture of exactly how emotionally prepared we are for super intelligence. I don't think it's dishwasher safe. Kurzweil calls the exponential growth of information technology the law of accelerating returns. And it's obvious we are not driving that bus. In fact, if we were to accidentally annihilate ourselves, it might make very little difference. Because a few hundred million years is nothing in the grand scheme of things, and some other species like cockroaches would eventually evolve big enough brains to invent a super intelligence, and then they would populate the world with their glowing orb of cockroach consciousness. But right now, it's our turn. Whether you like it or not, the singularity, like some sort of sci-fi Harvey Weinstein, is coming no matter what. Like, literally, in our lifetime. It's happening during your lifetime. In 2023, the average computer we go and buy is now calculating at 10 to the 16th cycles per second. That's the rate at which your brain does calculations. 25 years later, now a thousand bucks buys the computational power of the entire human race. So why isn't everyone paying attention to this? Why isn't this the top story every night? And why are supposedly smart people like Neil deGrasse Tyson seemingly unconcerned? In fact, the rise of artificial superintelligence doesn't bother this dude at all. I'm fearless about this. As our computing power gets better, as our machines get better, yeah, we will program machines to do stuff we need them to do. That will just continue. This idea that we're gonna create a humanoid that is gonna, no, that's the, uh, But Neil, but Neil, you, you, you tend to trust, you, you, you're doing a very good impersonation. <laughs> I know, I'm <laughs> We've lost Neil. <laughs> yeah, why would people think creating something smarter than us is potentially dangerous? Who are these fucking idiots? Oh, right. Those boneheads. Turns out the smartest people on the planet, sorry Neil, have been legitimately concerned with this. Like the late, great Stephen Hawking. The primitive forms of artificial intelligence we already have have proved very useful, but I think the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. You have to take that seriously, because it's obviously being said in a robot voice. Am I crazy? I mean, how do we even know those were his thoughts? Either that's his real opinion, or Stephen Hawking was hacked. It's not like it's that hard. Watch. I don't know if you could take it. No, you wanna see me naked, naked, naked. I could do that all day. So, let's roll some more. I like big butts. And I cannot lie, go shawty, it's your birthday. We gone party like it's your birthday. The point is, smart people are worried and Bill Gates is another smart guy who had these harsh words for people who don't take this threat seriously. You know, I try not to get too exercised about this, but when people say it's not a problem, that really, then I can start to get really, uh, uh, in a point of disagreement. That's as angry as Bill Gates gets. He is furious right there. Don't cross Bill Gates, he might politely correct you. I heard if you piss Bill Gates off, your charity only gets a million dollars. 
Meanwhile, the most famous AI doomsday spokesman said creating artificial intelligence is like summoning a demon. You know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water and he's like, yeah, you sure you can control a demon? <laughs> Didn't work out. So what did he do? Founded an AI research company. <laughs> At least its mission statement is for AI to be used for the benefit of all humanity. Plus the alternative is letting someone else do it. Elon knows this is a zero-sum game, and the group that wins this AI arms race will be the most powerful group on the planet. And as an insurance policy for creating an intelligence that could make us obsolete, Elon also started Neuralink. With um, a high bandwidth brain machine interface, I think we can actually go along for the ride. Um, and we can effectively have the option of merging with AI. For a breakdown on the latest announcements from Neuralink and how it could help us go along for the super intelligence ride, check out a previous episode I did from before I got classy AF linked in the description. I guess the only question left is, have I convinced Neil deGrasse Tyson? Help me find out. Tweet this video at Neil and let's see what he has to say now. I want to know why this threat does not bother this guy and I want to see him talk to Nick Bostrom about it. If you'd like to support the show, check out the description for links to Patreon, PayPal, Teespring, and more. If you haven't subscribed, but you're still here, you liked it. Think about subscribing. And let me know in the comments how excited you are or scared you are for the singularity. If you'd like to write jokes for this series, hit me up on Twitter at KneeTheCurve or join me on my Discord server. Winning jokes get credit in the description, a personal shout out, and once I reach a certain goal on Patreon, cash money. Thanks for watching. Peace.